Okay. So um, I think almost all three of you that are on have met Dr. Warren Means before, but we're thankful that he's on to teach our harvest lecture. Um, so this counts as the harvest lecture for the animal science. Um, well, it's actually harvesting is the, is the focal point for this year. So anyways, with that, I'm going to turn it over and um, you guys can enjoy Warren for the next hour. Or he does have a new job this year, so maybe he can explain what his new role is. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Yep. You can see the slides? Yes. Okay. Let me... Is that good or bad? Yeah, no, that's good. We can see them great. Okay. So I want to talk to you today about harvesting livestock, and I'm going to talk about beef and lambs and hogs. Um, slaughter. Slaughtering animals initiates physiological, metabolical, and meta metabolic and physical changes in animal tissues. And we term these, in meat science, we term these conversion of muscle to meat. So Brooke, we just talked about what meat is. Meat is muscle. But when we slaughter an animal, there are changes that occur in that muscle that we, that we call make it into meat. Some of these major changes include hormone changes due to animal stress, a switch from aerobic to anaerobic conditions, uh, an attempt by the tissues to maintain homeostasis to, to try to stay physiologically in a condition where they can function the muscle pH declines, and rigor mortis sets in eventually. And then we have some post-slaughter tenderization, which can occur due to activity of endogenous enzymes or enzymes that are present naturally in the muscle. And we also have some contamination. So these could be spoilage bacteria or pathogenic bacteria, and they could be viruses and other things too, but we'll, we'll talk about those as we go. So let's talk about some of these terms. Brooke, what is meat? Muscle. Very good, meat is muscle. So when we talk about uh, meat, uh, we, it is muscle. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about it in a little more detail. We're gonna define hormone, aerobic, anaerobic, homeostasis, all these terms. Meat is muscle just like Brooke said, that's most of it. And then also we would include fat, bone, connective tissue, nerves, blood vessels as meat. So when you eat a T-bone steak, you're, if you eat the whole thing, which you wouldn't eat the bone, I hope, you would have though muscle, fat, bone, connective tissue, nerves, blood vessels. And I've often had people bring me a sample of a, from a piece of meat and they say, what is this thing? It looks like a worm or something. And it, it always turns out to be a blood vessel, uh, a little larger one that is a little bit rubbery, but it's just a normal thing that you're going to find in meat. A hormone is a chemical produced by an endocrine gland. So you have glands in your body, all animals have glands, that this hormone goes to another target organ and elicits a response from that organ. And we may get like vasoconstriction. So the blood vessels may constrict. Uh, at slaughter, for instance. Aerobic means that oxygen is present. Sometimes we have anaerobic conditions, which means oxygen is not present. And some reactions can only occur with oxygen. Uh, so when it's not present, then you have to do something different. And this will become important when we talk about post-mortem metabolism. Because in a living animal, in us too, there's oxygen going to our tissues, to our muscle tissues. Once we slaughter an animal and we remove the blood, remove the lungs, there's no more oxygen uh, flowing to our tissues. Homeostasis. This is kind of an important term. It's a relatively narrow range of physiological conditions. Physiological conditions can include the pH, the temperature, the oxygen concentration, 
the concentration of ATP or the energy status of the cell. And once a cell gets outside this narrow range, then it can't function anymore. So once we slaughter an animal, we lose homeostasis and the cells then cease to function. And the cells we're gonna be talking about are, Brooke, muscle cells. You knew that though, didn't you? Okay, rigor mortis. Rigor mortis literally means stiffness, rigor of death, mortis. So eventually the muscle is going to enter a stage we call rigor mortis. And we'll learn why, why that happens a little later on. Then we also have spoilage bacteria. These are bacteria that uh, may contaminate the meat. Uh, they spoil food, but they don't really make us sick, as opposed to pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic foodborne bacteria are bacteria which cause human disease and in which food is the vehicle. So we eat the food, those bacteria are in the food, that makes us sick. Some examples of those are Shigatoxin Escherichia coli, or STEC, and one of those that you may have heard of is, is Escherichia coli 015787, that's an STEC. Salmonella, there's several species of salmonella. Listeria monocytogenes, Campylobacter jejuni, and Yersinia enterocolitica. And these are all bacteria that are sometimes found in meat. And when you eat the meat, if it isn't properly cooked, that'll make you sick. So let's talk about some of the major slaughter steps. And the ones in blue here are something that happens actually before slaughter, but I have them on the slide because they're important uh, for the quality of the product. So animal selection and management immediately prior to slaughter. We want to do everything we can to minimize stress. You want to load them calmly. You don't want to overload the truck. You don't want to transport in the heat of the day. Yesterday we drove up from Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was 100 and 101 degrees as we were driving. If you can imagine a semi-load of cattle or hogs, uh, it would actually kill some of those animals. So they would leave at midnight, perhaps, when it's cool and arrive at the plant early in the morning to minimize stress. Uh, fast. We want to fast or drift is another term prior to harvest. So we don't want to feed the animal and have it full right before we harvest it. And that we'll talk about in a minute, too. So during transport, we want to minimize stress. Larage. Larage is a term we use for resting prior to slaughter. And we want these animals to arrive at the slaughter plant, then rest for an hour or a half hour at least, maybe longer, prior to slaughter. And this, they'll, they'll regain some of their ATP they lost, and they'll become a little less stressed before we slaughter them. Then we'll start the slaughter process with anti-mortem inspection. If mortem means death, then anti means before. So anti-mortem is before death. So before we slaughter animals, if it's an inspected slaughter facility, these animals are uh, looked at by an inspector. Anything that looks sick is sorted off, perhaps the temperature is taken, and then that animal would uh, be looked at by a veterinarian to determine if it was a good thing to slaughter it or not. We may take a live weight in large plants. Sometimes they take a live weight of the whole truck load. So they weigh the truck coming in, they unload it, they weigh it going out. So you don't really have an individual weight. In our meat lab, we always take a live individual weight. Then immobilization. We want to somehow restrain the animal with a small chute or pen, or sometimes we actually have a head restraint uh, before we stun the animal. And if you're at home and you have a pencil, I want you to write underline stun or write down stun. This is one of the most important things we do. Brooke, are you writing this down? Okay, good. I can't see your hand, so. All right. This, yeah, I don't see a pencil in your hand. How's that? This renders the animal unconscious and insensitive to pain. Okay. So. When the animal is unconscious and insensible to pain, it means it won't feel anything we do to it, like when we stick it to bleed it, or we cut the ears off or the legs off, and that's exactly what we want. We want to do a proper stun on the animal to render it unconscious to pain. 
So this is a picture of a couple of stunning boxes. Can you see my cursor moving on the slide? Okay, so this is a hog or lamb stunning shoot. And the bottom of this, if we would look inside, actually, if you look at the bottom, an animal will come in and stand on the bottom and we can flip a trip lever and the bottom flips away. So they're suspended in a V and the animal then, the, the theory is the animal can't move back and forth very well. And that's good, so then we can get a good stun on that animal. This is a stunning box for beef, and we have modified this, and inside this area here, we actually have a head catch. So we try to catch the head on every beef that we slaughter, and that way we can get a more perfect stun on nearly every animal. So we won't have a missed stun on any animals. We're gonna talk about stunning mechanisms, but generally for hogs, and a lot of times for lambs, we use electrical stunner or electricity, essentially electrocute the brain so they're insensitive to pain and uh, um, unconscious. And in beef, we use in the meat lab a, a captive bolt. And in industry, they use some form of this where they actually push a metal rod or bolt into the brain of the animal. Now, when these, this is done correctly, when you stun an animal correctly, they'll drop like a ton of bricks. And you know that you've hit the brain and the animal is unconscious. But we have some things that we have to check. Okay? We're gonna get to those uh, in a little bit, okay? So after we stun the animal, we get a proper stun. We'll talk about those things. We shackle and hoist the animal. We exsanguinate or we stick it and bleed it. So there's a quiz at the end, and if you can spell exsanguination, you should get an extra point, okay? You insert the knife under the sternum uh, and upward at an upward angle, and we sever the carotid and arteries and the jugular veins, and that allows the blood to leave the carcass, and um, we get a minim minimum amount of damage to any surrounding muscular tissue. And Sometimes you see where if the knife is a little bit crooked or something, especially on a hog, then we have to do more trimming of the, of the shoulder area in that hog. We'll remove the feet and legs in beef and lambs. I'll remove the front and hind legs in beef at what we call the flat joints. So where the joints articulate in the knee of cattle, for instance, the front knee, there's several bones in there, and if we take them the most distal joint towards the foot, we're gonna get at the flat joint. In lambs, we actually remove those at the break joints. And uh, as animals mature, the bones become more ossified. And um, as a bone grows, it only grows from the ends, it doesn't grow from the middle. And at the ends, there's a area called the epiphyseal growth plate. And then there's a ball on the end where that articulates. Well, if the animal is young, you can break it off at that growth plate. But once the animal gets old enough that that becomes hard bone, then you leave that spool joint on. And that's important in lambs because that's a, a way that we um, age the carcass to determine maturity of a carcass. In hogs, we would remove the toenails. Um, uh, in beef, we would remove the hide. We would remove the pelt of lambs. We would fist a lamb uh, with our hand or pull it off a little differently so we leave what's called the fell membrane on there. And in hogs, we scald it and the hair and the scruff is removed because your skin is basically protein. It's connective tissue, collagen. And when you put that pig skin or that pig in the, the scalding vat, and the water's about 150 degrees Fahrenheit usually, then it starts to denature that, and the hair can pull or slip from that skin much easier. So this is a scalding vat. This would be filled with water and some detergent, and then you, we would lower the hog into that until the hair begins to slip. And then we would remove the hog from the water and put it in this area. This is the dehair. And these paddles have little, they're rubber or they're 
yeah, they're a rubber, like a heavy duty mud flap off a truck or something. And they have little bits of metal on the end and that scrapes most of the hair off the pig and it's bouncing around in this machine. Now the hair actually, or the hog actually bounces around in here pretty vigorously. And uh, you would think that it might bruise, but why doesn't it bruise? Brooke, you're the only one I can see, so you have to answer this. You want me to read your mind? Okay. It doesn't bruise because there's no blood. Is that what you were thinking? Because we bled yeah, it. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. So what is a bruise? A bruise is rupturing of blood vessels in the meat or the muscle, and then blood seeps out into the muscle tissue. But if we bled the animal, there's no blood pressure and there's no blood, you're not going to get a bruise. Okay? Oh, in the background there, you can see this is a scale where we get live weights on all our animals. Okay? Then we'll have head removal usually at the Atlanta occipital joint. The first cervical vertebrae, we take that off. Uh, we leave the head. We just take the head off between the uh, occipital joint and that atlas joint, that first cervical vertebrae. We leave all the vertebrae on the carcass. So none of the vertebrae are left on the head. And we have two joints in an animal. Uh, the first two vertebrae, the atlas on the, on the head, okay? And one moves the head up and down, and the other one, a different joint, moves so the animal can move its head from side to side, okay? If it's a male, we remove the penis and the sheath. We would weasen and tie the weasened, and the weasened is another name for the esophagus. So we're going to have to weasen it, and that means we have a tool that we use that wraps around that, that uh, weasened or the esophagus, and we push it up so it loosens the connective tissue in the thoracic cavity because we want it to pull out easily when we eviscerate, otherwise it might tear and then contaminate the carcass. Uh, in beef and lambs, we tie this off. In hogs, we don't have to tie it off because in hogs, they're monogastrics and we're monogastrics too, but we have a lower esophageal uh, sphincter. So at the, at the end of our esophagus, we have a sphincter that keeps the stomach contents from coming out the esophagus when the animal is, is hung upside down. We would split the sternum, we would bung. Bunging means we loosen the anus, the rectum, and if it's a female, the vulva. We would put a bag over that generally and tie it to prevent carcass contamination because we don't want any feces leaking out on the carcass when we're removing that. Then evisceration. Evisceration is kind of tricky. Um, there's some very skilled people that do this in the, in the uh, slaughter plants and they'll remove all the abdominal cavity organs. And these are separated from the organs in the thoracic cavity by the diaphragm, okay? So the diaphragm is the thin muscle and some connective tissue that if you feel the end of your rib cage, it kind of runs and follows that, okay? Above it are the lungs and below it, right below it is the liver, okay? So in the abdominal cavity, we have the stomach. If we're talking about hogs, if we're talking about a ruminant like beef or lambs, we'd have what we call the rumen, which is a stomach, but it's a larger four compartment stomach because they eat uh, grass or hay or a lot of roughage. And there's fermentation going on in there that can break down that uh, cellulose. A small intestine, large intestine, the rectum, the anus, reproductive tract if it's a female, the liver and the gallbladder that's attached to the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, mesenteric lymph nodes, and the kidneys. And we take those out generally. Sometimes in beef, for instance, we leave the kidneys in. Uh, but those are the abdominal organs. Then we go to the thoracic cavity. And in the thoracic cavity, we have the lungs, the heart, the trachea, the esophagus is in blue because when we take all these out, it's attached to the stomach or the rumen, so we pull that out too. And that's why we have to weasen the animal to make sure we can get that esophagus out. 
Then we split them. We split beef and we split hogs and we don't generally split lambs. And we do this because it allows faster cooling. And if you didn't split a beef carcass in half, it would take so long to cool that mass, massive amount of muscle that it would start to sour. So, and also we get lighter sides. So a hog carcass that we split in half, you can handle the side a little easier. Beef carcasses we split in half, still they're very heavy. So we didn't have to quarter those or even cut them further down to get to be able to handle those. <coughs> After we've eviscerated and we split the carcass, then we trim the carcass. And we do this with a knife and a hook, and we keep sanitizing our knife and a hook. And we want to trim any contamination that we can see off of that carcass. Then we have another inspection, and this is a post-mortem inspection. So the inspector will come and look at this carcass, and if they see anything on there that needs to be trimmed, then it's rolled to the side and it has to be trimmed again. Then most plants would have a carcass wash. And this can be an actual steam cabinet, a cabinet the carcass rolls in and it's washed with hot water, actually steam. And, or it can be a high pressure wash. This is what we use in our meat lab. And we follow that by a hot water wash. The water has to be greater than 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're actually pasteurizing the surface and killing bacteria on the surface of the carcass. Uh, this would be important. It gives them a longer shelf life in the cooler. And if there's any pathogens, then we're also killing some of those pathogens. We don't kill all the bacteria. We just reduce it by maybe a factor of 10 or 100 at most. We also are using organic acid rinses in slaughter plants, like lactic acid, to rinse the carcass after it's washed. This also helps uh, decrease the bacterial load. Then we'll get a hot carcass weight. Almost all commercial slaughter plants will get a hot carcass weight, uh, which includes the carcass, but none of the viscera, not the hide, not the feet, not the head. So that's, that's the difference. Then we would somehow give the carcass an ID. And sometimes that's a tag on the carcass. Um, sometimes it's on the trolley electronic tag, but that they would know where that carcass came from and be able to ID it. Then the carcass goes to chill. And we call the first cooler that a carcass goes into, we call that the hot box or the drip cooler because it's where you put the hot carcasses. And it's where the carcasses drip on the floor because of the moisture from just washing them. Uh, these coolers are about 34 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. Um, they have a lot more refrigeration capacity. So the hot box is designed to put a lot of hot carcasses in and cool them down rapidly. And then after that, you could move them into a different a storage cooler where it might only have half as much cooling capacity or sometimes a third as much cooling capacity as a hot box. It's really important to cool a carcass to less than 40 Fahrenheit in 24 to 48 hours. Um, you get a decrease, a decreased chance of uh, beef round sour, and you limit microbial growth that way. And the this is I'm talking about the internal deep temperature of the meat. Um, the surface would cool to 40 quicker than that. Okay, this is important that they don't want to cut up a carcass unless it's probably below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, because then every time we touch a carcass with a knife or a saw, it we're contaminating it. And if it's cold, then those bacteria aren't going to grow very fast. So we don't want to cut up warm carcasses. Some of the details of I want to talk about are feed withdrawal, stunning, dressing percentage, and some of the muscle physiology that happens post-mortem. Uh, we'll talk about glycolysis. And we'll talk about dark cutters and, and how they happen. And then I want to talk a little bit about aging and postmortem tenderization because this is really an important factor in the meat that we eat. So we withdraw feed from animals 12 to 24 hours prior to transportation and harvest. We don't withdraw water. They're required to have water 
and uh, USDA requires that they have water at the plant when they arrive at the plant. But if we withdraw feed, it reduces the overall transport weight. The feed is not going to be fully utilized by the animal anyway. And it can reduce the excreta during, during transport. So it could maybe keep the animals a little bit cleaner and less manure slopping out of the truck and so forth. So we want to decrease microbial contamination. The feces may be carrying microbes. Well, definitely is carrying microbes may or may not be carrying pathogens, but that gets on the hide or the hair. And then also it can decrease the, the frequency that you have to wash your truck. And I know I live in Billings, Montana, and when I go home to see my mom, there's a truck wash station there uh, just south of Billings a ways, and they have lagoons, and they, a lot of these uh, livestock hauling trucks have to stop there, wash their truck before they can go get another load of cattle. So if we have less fill or less feed in the gut, then we're going to reduce the risk of gastrointestinal tract lacerations or just cutting it with your knife during evisceration. So that's good because that would contaminate the carcass. We're going to de decrease costs of handling the, the digestion or the manure that's in the, in the rumen, for instance, in the slaughter facility. So we want to fast them prior to slaughter. Shrink. Now shrink is the percent weight loss between loading at the production facility and unloading at slaughter plant. In cattle, often we get something like a 4% shrink. It varies, depends on how far you have to haul them and whether you took them off feed and all these kinds of things. Uh, sometimes we give them a pencil shrink. So you might weigh them at the feedlot and deduct 4% because you know they're gonna lose that much at least before they get to the slaughter plant. There's not really much change in carcass weight during transportation of animals. It has to be pretty severe, long-term stress uh, transportation before you get a change in the carcass weight. Most of that is a change in the gut fill. Now, we talked about stunning, which renders an animal unconscious and insensible to pain. So we want to do this because it prevents suffering. It's a more humane way to slaughter. It renders the animal insensible to pain, so it doesn't sense any pain. It's safer for worker conditions because you don't have animals that are uh, moving and could hurt a worker. And it improves meat quality. So we want a good stun for meat quality, also for humane reasons. Stunning methods that are approved by USDA include chemical, and that would be carbon dioxide, and some a few plants in the U.S. use carbon dioxide for hogs, and the hogs are gently herded into like a pen that's like an elevator, and it's lowered slowly into a pit, and there's CO2 down there, and eventually the animal falls over because there's no oxygen, and they suffocate essentially. And if you've watched this, it's very calm, and the animals really don't seem to undergo any stress when this happens then they're raised up and their exsanguination occurs or bleeding, and that's the way that the animal's stunned. Only large plants can afford that, and not, you don't see too many of those. So a lot of other ways are used that include mechanical, which in our case, we use a captive bolt. Some small plants would use gunshot. This is a little bit more dangerous because you actually have a projectile leaving the barrel and electrical stimulation. So we pass electrical current through the brain and that renders the animal unconscious. So this is a captive bolt stunner and we would come take it apart right here and put a blank, 25 caliber blank maybe in there. And then when we fire it, this bolt will come out of this end. So if you have that against the forehead, against the brain, then that bolt would penetrate the brain. And if it's positioned properly, when that goes off, it sounds like a gunshot, the animal drops immediately. And that's a good stun. This is an electrical stimulator. And these are the probes where the electricity would pass from one to the other through the brain of the animal. In our plant, when we do hogs, we do the brain, and that renders them unconscious. Then we go around the other side, we flip our, our gate open, 
and we also put it on the chest and we do it so that we can stop the heart from beating. And, and that's the way that we would stun most hogs in our meat lab facility. So these are probably the most important things that I'm going to talk about today. Brooke, that means that they'll be on the test. Okay. Indications of a proper stun. You want a flaccid neck, no straining of the neck. The tongue may hang out of the mouth because it's relaxed. The eyelid should be wide open because it takes a muscle to close your eyelid. Okay. The pupils should be fully dilated. There should be no vocalization, no mooing or oinking or blatting of a lamb, no vocalization. No rhythmic breathing. There may be some non-rhythmic breathing or moving the animal, which is normal from depolarization of muscle that's occurring, but no rhythmic breathing. No eye reflex in response to touch. And this is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important ones. If you touch the animal's eye and it blinks, then it's not properly stunned. If you can touch the animal's eye and it does not blink, then you know you've got a proper stun. There should be no spontaneous or natural blinks of the eye and no tense and moving tongue or lips. Okay, so these are very important indications of a proper stun of an animal. In beef, the stunning location, we draw an X between the eyes and the horns or the poles where the horns would be and that's where you stun and that's where the brain is and this is depicts the brain of the beef and you would want to be perpendicular to the forehead and then that animal is going to immediately lose consciousness in hogs it's very similar you draw that x most people make a mistake of stunning animals right between the eyes that's a sinus cavity that's not going to get into the brain. So here's a hog head that we cut in half in the meat lab, and the eyes are down here. So if you stun down between the eyes, you're going to get in this sinus cavity, you're not going to get the brain. You need to move up and make that X, and then you're going to get into the brain. One thing you need to note, if you're stunning hogs, there's a lot of bone above the brain. So you need to use, if you're using a rifle, and I've, I've run into this a few times, people are stunning hogs, they're not using a high enough caliber, it's not getting into the brain, it's not doing a good job. Now, dressing percentage. Dressing percentage is the carcass weight divided by the live weight times 100. So that's a smaller number. And, uh, in beef, we expect dressing percentage to be about 63%. Now, if you have 100 head and you do dressing percentage on every one, you might get an average around 62 or 63, but there will be variation. And that's plus or minus 5%. And that variation depends mostly on gut fill, but we'll talk about some of those other things. In lambs, if they're shorn pretty tight, you'll have about a 52% plus or minus 5%. If they're unshorn, more like 50% plus or minus 5%. Brooke, why is that? Do you want me to read your mind again? Brooke, are you thinking? Are you thinking it's because of the wool? Unshorn lambs have heavier wool on their fleece? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yep. Hogs dressing percent is 75%. Now I have a question for uh, who's this kid that just joined? Matt, can you hear me? Burgundy. They're muted. Yes, I can hear you. Why would a hog have a lot higher dressing percent? It sounds like you, you have a room full of people with you. It can help. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think I heard, you can turn, you can mute now, Burgundy. Okay. Um, so 
This is like Star Wars. I think I heard uh, through all that background noise, I think I heard Burgundy say, because hogs are monogastrics, they have a smaller stomach and they don't have as much fill. Did you hear that, Brooke? That's what I heard through there. Okay. Hogs also, we leave the feet and part of the legs on the hogs. So that makes it a higher dressing percentage. We leave part of the jowl on a hog, that makes it a higher dressing percentage. We typically leave the skin on a hog, that makes it a higher dressing percentage. Okay? So it's all these things down here. They have less gut fill because they have smaller gut. They're a monogastric. We're not talking about this for hogs. They have the skin on, the feet and legs are on, and then muscling and fatness can make a difference. Not as much difference as some of those other things. Okay, any questions on dressing percentage? Seeing none. Okay, let's talk now about one of my favorite topics, muscle physiology. Post-mortem muscle physiology. Post means after, after death. The muscle cells work hard to maintain the energy balance. They want to produce ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And they want to do that as long as possible. And postmortem, the, the pH of the muscle decreases. pH stands for the negative log base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay? And so the muscle becomes more acidic. Typically in living muscle, we have a pH of about 7.4. 7, .4. 7 is, is neutral. So it's a little bit basic. And if it changes very much, you die. Okay. Sometimes in hogs that are stress prone, they get excited and they produce a lot of lactic acid and they can't pump it out of the muscle cell fast enough or they get it into the blood and the blood pH decreases, they die. Okay. So that's where we're talking about homeostasis. You've got to keep that pH close to 7.4. Now the no normal postmortem muscle pH is 5.4 to 5.7. So you can see we drop almost two full points between living muscle and meat, okay? pH affects meat color, it affects meat flavor, and if it's, the pH is high, then we get a dark color because the muscle can hold more moisture and we don't reflect as much light, so we get a dark color. And that's called uh, dark meat, or sometimes DFE, dark, firm, dry. Now, rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is stiffness of death, okay? This occurs when there's not enough ATP. So if I scoot back here, and you can see my arm, this is one protein in muscle we would call myosin, I mean active. And then myosin would have a head, and my hand is a head. So if you have calcium release, the head can attach. And then when we get contraction, it goes like this, okay? Now, if in order for that head to release from the actin so the muscle can move, you need ATP. So when you run out of energy, it can't move. That's rigor mortis. Okay, so if you're taking notes, write down rigor mortis is when you run out of ATP. Man, these are, I don't know where these are coming from. Interesting. Okay. If the pH is high, what's the color? Lighter or darker? I'm wouldn't it be, I feel like it would be, shoot. Lighter. Lighter? Who's writing that? Is that you, Burgundy? Write darker. Page would be darker. 
okay? Because there's more moisture held in. All right, are you ready for biochemistry? Okay, relax, I'll explain it to you. So in your blood, you have glucose, okay? When glucose comes into the muscle, it's phosphorylated. Burgundy, wake up, okay? And that way it can't flow back out of the muscle. So it's in the muscle. Now, when we kill an animal, do we have blood? In the muscle anymore? Say no, no, okay? So the, the sugar molecules that are in here, that's all that's gonna come in, what's in there. We store that as what we call glycogen, which is kind of, you can think of that as animal starch. This glucose can go all through this metabolic process. And glucose has how many carbons? Six. Six, very good, okay? So glucose comes down here, and then it's split in half, so there's three, and comes down here, and then goes to pyruvate, and how many pyruvate molecules do you get? Two, because you get one from this, and then this over here can go back here and go through and make two pyruvate. So if this is six, and you get two of these, how many carbons in pyruvate? Three, and three is six, right? Are you counting, Brooke? Good girl, okay? So we get glucose, we make pyruvate. If we have oxygen, a living animal, it goes into the TCA cycle, and it goes around here, and we make a lot of energy for the cell. That's good. Guess what? Dead animals, animals that we slaughter, don't have oxygen, okay? So if there's no oxygen, you cannot do this TCA cycle because it's anaerobic. And this pyruvate is transformed into lactate because we need NADH up here to make this reaction occur. And remember, why is the animal doing this? It's to produce these ATP molecules because it wants to maintain energy in the muscle cell, okay? So anaerobic, we convert pyruvate to lactate, and we keep using the glycogen up until it's gone. Now, we're producing lactate, which is an acid. We're producing uh, hydrogen ions, and hydrogen ions are what lower the pH. So by doing this, we're lowering the pH of the muscle from about 7.4 to 5.4, 5.7. So that's the changing, or what we called in the beginning, conversion of muscle to meat. Does that make sense? Burgundy, does that make sense to you? I think she's shaking her head yes, or she went to the refrigerator for something to eat. Okay? Yeah. It makes sense. Good, thank you. Energy metabolism. We get hydrogen ion production and muscle pH declines. Muscle pH decreases with time. It's due to hydrogen ions and it's also due to lactate accumulation, okay? We have conversion of pyruvate to lactate. Uh, we get these hydrogen ions produced. It's necessary to regenerate the NADH, which we needed up here, the NAD, to keep this reaction going, okay? Now, the rate that this occurs is highly variable, and it can affect meat quality, especially in hogs. They're more variable, it seems, than other animals. So this pH change, from pH in the live muscle of 7.4 to pH in the post-mortem muscle, uh, or I should say post-rigor muscle of five and a half about, is really important. And here's a graph 
This would be live muscle, a little above seven. And this would be different declining curves of pH. So if the pH doesn't decline very much, then it's dark. Now let's go back and let's take a look. If the pH doesn't drop, and we go and look at this metabolic pathway, this is the glycolytic pathway, and it doesn't drop, what can we say? Well, why wouldn't it drop? It won't drop because we don't have enough glycogen. Okay? If you have enough glycogen, 1%, the pH is going to drop. But if you don't have very much, then it'll use it all up, but it won't be that much and it won't drop the pH. Where would this occur? It can occur, for instance, in bulls. If you bring bulls to a slaughter plant and you mix them and they're fighting and they're using all that energy, they're using up their glycogen. And in bulls, we actually see a higher rate of dark cutters. Okay. Now, as we can see, the normal pH is about five and a half, and we're going to have a normal kind of color in here. Okay. So the pH drops at a kind of a normal, slowish rate, we get a normal color. If it doesn't drop enough, we get a dark color. If it drops, too far, we get a pale color. We can get extremely pale if in some pigs they have this genetic anomaly and the pH can drop really fast. While the muscle is warm, it denatures proteins and then we get this extremely pale pork. And that's poor quality. That's bad. It looks like we have a very young meat scientist there on the couch. I love it. Burgundy, is that someone you know? It's our new little sister. Cool. All right. Now I want to talk about aging, okay? Aging uh, is just storing meat at refrigeration temperature in the carcass form. And we get an improvement in tenderization. So it becomes less tough, more tender. There's an enzyme called calpane. It's endogenous, means it occurs naturally in the muscle. Okay? And that enzyme hydrolyzes muscle proteins, or it breaks them down. And when you do that, then it's easier to chew through that fragmented muscle. So it improves meat tenderness. However, and there's always a however, there's another protein called calpostatin, which is the inhibitor of calpane. So we know now that some animals have three copies of the gene that makes calpostatin. They would be more tough because they have more calpostatin, they have less calpane activity. And the other animal might have one copy. So there's more calpane activity, it improves meat tenderness. And there are actually genetic tests that you can do for this. So here's a graph of some progeny from two different sires, okay? And one of them is tender, the big dots, and one of them, the little square dots, is tough. So you can see that the average of the progeny from the tough sire are tougher on average than the progeny from the tender sire. Which one would you want to get a carcass from and put in your freezer? Mm, the tender side. The tender side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, one thing you got to notice is that even this tender sire has some outliers that are pretty tough sometimes. Okay. So that's the biological variation. We can't predict perfectly how it's going to turn out. But generally, the tender sire would be better. Now, I want you to look at this. This is zero days postmortem, 10, 20, 30. In each case, the longer you age it, the more tender it becomes. So you want to age it at least a couple of weeks 
So you get through this really tough phase, even in this one, at two weeks aging, it's the same tenderness as this tender sire at zero days. So that's good. Do we do this in large plants? Not in the carcass form, but when you cut up the carcass and you put it in a vacuum bag and you put it in a box, it's still refrigerated, it may be, and this is one of the problems, somewhere between three and 33 days once it gets sold in the grocery store. So I actually have a student that works in a grocery store here in Laramie, and I'll ask her for the date on the box so that I want the one that's been in the cooler the longest if I'm going to buy a strip loin or a steak or something, because I know it's going to be more tender. Okay, so we've learned that there are specific steps that must be followed during slaughter of livestock. We want it to be humane, we want it to be safe, we want to have a high quality product. We know that slaughter initiates physiological, metabolic, and physical changes in animal tissues. Uh, these are termed conversion of muscle to meat, and we uh, can get even more tender or a higher quality product when we age that product after slaughter. Does anybody have any questions? So why would you look for like the older, more dated meat when you go to the grocery store than when you than the newer stuff? Okay, good question. Now, this assumes that it's not like in a tray overwrap or aerobic package because it'll only last when it has oxygen for about three days and then it'll spoil. But if it's yeah. in a vacuum bag and you get it 20 days or 30 days post water, it's going to be more tender. This is sure for it. Okay. It's, it's essentially you, you take a piece of meat and you put it in a blade and you measure how much force it takes to shear that piece of meat in half. A cook, a cook. Okay. Okay. So it only works for vacuum package, but if you, if it's sitting in the plant for a week and then it's in the truck for a few days and it goes to the warehouse from the store and then it sits in there a week and then it gets to the store and it sits on the shelf in a week for a, in the box and it's still in the vacuum package and then it's three weeks out here and then they cut it and put it out in the case, it's going to be much more tender than it was three days. Okay. Good question. Do you have any other questions? Burgundy, do you have a question? Do you eat meat? Yes. yes. What's your favorite? Sirloin. Why? Let me tell you why. The sirloin is relatively tender. There's more tender cuts, but the sirloin is noted to have good development of beef flavor. So you must like beef flavor. Yeah, we do. Why do you keep looking at her? You do, good. What's your favorite meat, Brooke? Hmm. I really like like the um shoot. chicken. The eye round, that's my favorite. Really? Yeah. Let me tell you something about the eye of round. Okay. This muscle's the name of that muscle is the semitendinosus muscle. And if you look at a horse and you look at the butt of a horse straight on. It's a muscle on the outside of the leg that comes down that you can really see a nice demarcation there, okay? That muscle has a lot of connective tissue that we call um, elastin, okay? Elastin does not change during cooking, so it stays tough. So the eye of round is one of the tougher muscles that you're gonna have in a beef carcass, for instance. So you can even put it in a crock pot and you'll notice that 
it'll fall apart, but it doesn't really get nice and tender like, let's say, a beef chuck roast, okay? Because that elastin, it doesn't degrade during cooking. So I'm shocked that that's your favorite cut. Do you like the beef tenderloin? Yeah, it's more tender, but it doesn't have as good a flavor as a sirloin, for instance. Okay, I was gonna ask Dawn what her favorite meat cut is, but she would say lamb, I think. No? Um, no, not really, honestly. Hmm. I would say chicken and you don't want to hear that. In my meat class, chicken is a vegetable. Just kidding. I know that, so I didn't want to say that. <laughs> so the other night I had some company out and I cooked some beef, sirloin steaks. I cooked some lamb, uh, and they were just shoulder chops, and I cooked some goat. Guess which one was the best, the favorite of the night? I want to say goat. That uh, was a lamb. The oh. goat was good. The beef was good. But the lamb was the most tender and most flavorful. So that was a favorite for that night. I will tell you, Lori, that I'm with Brooke, though, is that I like a round steak. And let me tell you why. is because I don't like But the she said an eye of round. Well, it's true. I just don't like the, the fat. Like, I don't like that super flat flavor. And I think a round or an eye round steak doesn't have that super fat. True. A top round steak is one of the leanest muscles in the beef carcass. It might be tough, but... I like that dull flavor, so. Okay. My general, uh, what I tell my class is, don't make fun of people if they like the eye of round or if they like their steak uh, well done or burnt. As long as they're eating beef, I'm fine with however they like it. And they probably go hand in hand because I like it well done as well, so. Double whammy. So uh, this is the last thing. And then, my medium rare. <laughs> good girl. <That's, laughs> and it so happens that if you cook muscle to a temperature greater than 160 degrees Fahrenheit, we get what's called myofibrillar toughening. And it's harder to chew through those myofibrillar protein. And so it's tougher. And 160 is, is textbook medium. So medium rare. It's not going to be tough. It's going to be a little more juicy. But Dawn, if she likes her round steak cooked, well done, go ahead. Enjoy yourself. It's like jerky then, right? No, it's not that. It's not that dehydrated, but yeah. Anybody have another question? I have to tell you one thing and then I'll quit. Before I retire, my goal is to, that every student in college in the animal science program at UW will know my favorite steak. So you better share with these kids. So oh, they yes, know. I thought you would ask. My favorite steak is, and this is a proper terminology, beef, loin, top loin, steak, comma, boneless. So like a New York strip, okay? or Kansas City. And then in the meat manual, the imp specifications, institutional meat purchase specifications, there's things called PSOs, purchaser specified options. And of course, I made up my own. I call them MSOs, means specified options. The MSO is aged 40 days. And then the cooking instructions are lightly dusted with garlic salt and black pepper cook to textbook medium rare. Isn't that what you said, Brooke? Medium rare. That's it. It's on every test I give. Yeah, he might be telling you that's a bonus question on his quiz or something, right? Mm -hmm. It would be. <laughs> I don't know if it is on this quiz. I haven't looked at that in a while. Yeah. All right, All any right. other questions for Rory? Thanks, guys. Hey, before you get off, um, let me, wait, let me stop recording.